Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome an icon in our field to UTV, and I really appreciate uh, the turnout with the provost, the dean, and uh, President Callender to hear about this incredibly important topic today. Dr. Uh, a. <laughs> Thomas McClellan has a 35-year history in treatment research and has been a leader in this field for, in the, uh, for particularly the last 20 years. Um, we are uh, thrilled to have him here because Tom is going to tell us about the current way we think about addiction science. He was the chief author, excuse me, chief scientific author of the Facing Addiction Report by the Surgeon General, which was released in December of 2016, so we'll hear about that effort. Tom is a professor of psychiatry at Penn. He's uh, the founder and the chairman of the board of the Treatment Research Institute in Philadelphia. He's published 450, 500 papers in his career. Everyone uh, is really excited to have you here today, and I don't want to take any more of your time. So, Tom? Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, all I can say is it must be a slow day in Galveston to get all these people. I'd be outside if I were you. And uh, uh, Catherine's exactly right. This, what I'd like to talk about is this, uh, I think, really important work that the Surgeon General uh, commissioned. And um, I'm going to tell you the end before I tell you the beginning, so that if you fall into a deep coma, as have so many before you, um, you'll at least have something to say to the people back at the office. And uh, it goes like this. One, use, misuse, and addiction are three separate terms. They are controlled by different factors, and they're all important. Two, you can prevent addiction and misuse. You can intervene early to prevent misuse from turning into addiction, and you can treat even very serious cases of addiction successfully. Recovery is now an expectable goal of comprehensive care. Okay? Finally, just to make all the doctors here feel good, addiction has been willfully neglected by the medical profession and the insurance industry, and it's been an expensive mistake, but a correctable one, okay? Enjoy uh, reading your uh, emails and uh, falling asleep, okay? <laughs> all right, so as I said, these are three key terms. And I, I give this talk a lot to state legislatures and in federal circles, too. And they don't know the difference. Use, abuse, addiction, it's really all the same thing. And those people that are overdosing on opioids, they're, they're all addicts, right? Uh, no, no. Use is just that. Any use of any of the commonly known addictive substances, prescribed or non-prescribed, commercial or, or illicit. And use of everything, <clears throat> excuse me, marijuana, cocaine, opiates, uh, benzodiazepines, use is driven by the same factors that drive the use of iPhones, Hershey bars, uh, any other commodity. You make something cheaper, you make it more available, you make it easier to get, more people will use. Okay, let's take opioids. Last year, 93 million people used an opioid. Uh-huh. Misuse is, I'm going to beat this horse to death. I warn you now. Misuse is actually a pretty new term. It's a European term. We use abuse in this country, but it's a pejorative term. So the Surgeon General agreed to talk about misuse. And it's very important for a couple of reasons that I'll, I'll get to. And it is use of any substance at a, at a dose, under circumstances, where it causes harm to you or those around you. Hmm, not quite sure what you mean. Okay, how about drunk driving? I take, I go and I have four glasses of wine, okay? Which is a very attractive thought right now. And um, that's fine. 
that's using wine. I have no other health con condition. I'm using wine. Now I decide to get into my car and drive. That is misuse of wine. Stay with alcohol. You might say, gal who has two drinks, uh, you know, young healthy woman has two drinks of alcohol um, every night. Is she an addict? Hell no. Is she misusing? Well, I need to know more. Oh, she's pregnant. Yes, that's misuse because it's now clear that alcohol during pregnancy, this is from the WHO, is now the major reason for traumatic brain injury worldwide. No, it's not football. No, it's not motorcycles. It's alcohol during pregnancy. So that even two drinks could be misuse. Um, continuing that, because this is a big deal. The reason, uh, I'll say again, why it's such a big deal is all my life, there were people who used, feel free, there's lots of uh, seats up here at the top. Uh, there were people who used and partied and then there were addicts. There was nothing in the middle. And we'll talk about that. It's, the way, it's because of the way we used to think about addiction. We don't think that way anymore. Good people don't think that way. Anyway, um, <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll beat that horse pretty well. But addiction is something different. And here's the one that people really, they, they may go along with me about misuse. But they think addiction is just a lot of misuse, just a lot of party. People who just don't want to stop partying. They're addicts. No. I mean, they may not want to start partying, but that's not why they're addicts. We're going to talk about that a lot. Uh, the concept about addiction has changed dramatically with the latest uh, 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 research that led to the DSM-5, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Okay? Addiction can be to any of the substances that I've talked about. Yes, you can become addicted to marijuana. Yes, you can become addicted to cocaine. Yes, you can become addicted to lots of it, lots of these, uh, medica uh, these, these substances. And it is loss of control. And once addicted, it is, as they say in medicine, sui generis. It is a brand new illness, often a chronic illness. So think about that, and think about that relative to what you would do if you had an addicted relative. Where would you send them? Probably to a place that gave 30 days of treatment for a chronic illness. Think about it. Okay, so these, now you're experts, these are the terms that I'm going to be using. <clears throat> well, how do they distribute? Let's draw a picture and show how the United States looks. So this is adults uh, 12 and older, data come from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and uh, it's a pyramid. So the large, and it, it, it displays substance use, all drugs other than cigarettes. Yes, alcohol's here, marijuana, cocaine, opiate, etc. cetera. Um, displays the use of all that, and the, um, the further up you go, the more serious the use, the more frequent, um, and as you can tell, because it's a pyramid, as you go up, um, you get fewer people. So down here is where most of the United States is. United States is not by any means the greatest drug using uh, country in the world. It's widely um, misconstrued. Uh, uh, alcohol, opiates, etc. League leader is Russia, by, and there's nobody in second place, okay? But mostly, <laughs> it, it's really true, that it, Russia is one of those uh, countries where the average age, of, average life expectancy, for, particularly for males, is going down. And it is going down because of dramatic uh, misuse and addiction to opiates and alcohol. So that's the biggest part of the population. Now, as you go up, your keen eye tells you there's a line there. Well, it's not a straight line and there's holes in it. That's where misuse starts, harmful use, misuse. 40 million people in the United States are misusing. 
a substance. And no, they're not addicted. No, they're not, they haven't lost control. They're using in a manner that is harmful to their health or to others. I, I see several of you taking pictures here fine with me, but these slides are available. They're on this computer and they are available for your use if you, you wish them. Um, the, the reason there are holes, the reason there are, it's wavy and there are holes is because the level where misuse is is different across substances and across types of people. Virtually any use among young people is misuse. Um, but now you go up further the pyramid and now you see this nice, crisp, clear, bright line. Now you're in Charlie Sheen country. That's addiction, okay? <laughs> There's where you meet diagnostic criteria for loss of control over your use of the substance or substances that you've had. And we're going to talk more about that. But main point, 21,400,000 is a conservative estimate of people who meet diagnostic criteria. Could be as high as 25 million. About the same number of people who meet diagnostic criteria for diabetes in this country. Okay. And just to round it off, there in the top, can't even see it probably if you're sitting in the back, this little pinnacle is the number of people that are getting any kind of treatment at all. So that's approximately 20% of the people who are clearly, no doubt about it, addicted. But it's not even a percent of the people who are affected and are using. So I'm going to talk a lot about diabetes today. Those numbers are, that's, that's called a treatment penetration rate. In, in diabetes, that would be unheard of. Congress would be passing, the, the, doing the one thing they can't seem to do, pass bills to enact, uh, you know, insulin being dropped from airplanes all over the country if we had 20% diabetes. It's about 80%. Uh, the, the next closest is depression, it's about 55% treatment penetration. We ain't close. Huh, that's sort of interesting. Well, I wonder why that is. Well, now again, I want to highlight, I think that'll do it, misuse is important for two reasons. Every, by its very de uh, definition, every time an individual misuses alcohol or any of these other drugs, it has the potential to cause harm, and it's expensive harm. I'm going to show you in a minute. But in addition, something that wasn't really acknowledged. And now, thanks to chronic pain, we know it, we know it uh, more clearly for uh, opiates. Any progressive misuse, high dose use of opioids, even for the treatment of chronic non-cancer pain, it prom can promote later addiction. Because what is being promoted are brain changes that I will, will talk about. So misuse has been ignored in this country at a policy level, and it's killing our young. Misuse has not even been considered with regard to, um, to the treatment of substance use disorders, and it is affecting our ability to deliver the true continuum of care, okay? So misuse is to addiction what pre-diabetes is to diabetes, okay? All right, right, who cares? All right, I guess that keeps you busy, Tom, but come on, really. Um, here's why you ought to think about caring. Misuse now, not addiction, misuse. 28% of college rape and interpersonal violence episodes involve one or more people who are misusing a substance. 44% of injuries, 63% of disabilities, 74% of all deaths. I'm a, and notice, I'm not talking about old geezers like me. I'm talking about 12 to 25 are young, okay? Those are pretty high, oh yeah? Even higher if you're a minority person. Wow, that's a lot. That's a big deal. Still not convinced. Probably not worth it. Well, what are the dollar values here? Well, the annual cost, not for, in my lifetime, annual cost of substance misuse and addiction, I should have put that there, $440 billion every year. 
Please keep this in mind. You guys are properly bitching and moaning about the loss of uh, money from your NIH budget. There's $440 billion every year. Yeah, that does sound like a lot. Where does it come from? Most of it comes from social and criminal services. Not criminal, actually. The biggest chunk of the money, the crime costs, incarceration costs, arraignment costs are very significant. Not the biggest social cost. The biggest social cost is loss of employment, um, uh, disability care. W, the World Health Organization says addiction and uh, substance use disorders are the second most disabling condition and the most expensive of all of them. Yes, including cancer, hypertension, diabetes, all of them. Why? Because it hits you when you're young and you're right in the middle of your workforce. Notice $120 billion every year in health care. No, that's not what we spend on addiction. That's a fraction of that. It costs health care $120 billion in misdiagnoses, poor adherence to medications, excessive utilization of emergency room and, and hospital costs every single year. Yeah, well, you know, the government's got a lot of money. It's probably not that big. Well, in comparison, those are the costs at the worst year that we ever had in Iraq and Afghan wars combined. So it dwarfs the expenditure that our military has made on, on uh, saving our country, okay? So with that, let's talk about, so I think, I hope that makes the case this is a what we used to call a BFD, a big deal, okay? <laughs> and big, big fat deal. What do you, what do you think I'd say? Come on, people have bad minds. Anyway, but can you do anything? I mean, isn't this really an intractable thing? Hasn't drugs and alcohol been around for centuries? And by the way, doesn't it just affect a fixed number of people? Those guys that never paid attention in high school, those guys that the police picked up as delinquents when they were in junior, isn't it really them? No, it ain't. It's not, okay? You might say there's not much we can do because when you look at uh, reports in the National High School Survey of past month use of any substance, that is a pretty flat line from 2000 right up to 2015. Not a hell of a lot of progress, 2015. Can't blame that on the Democrats, can't blame it on the Republicans. So you might say, you can't do anything. Even binge drinking, which is five drinks or more, that hasn't shown. And if anything, it's gone up a little bit. Wow. But that's not the conclusion of the Surgeon General's report. So I'm not here to tell you that this is an intractable problem. I'm not here to tell you there's nothing we can do. Quite the opposite. Surgeon General's report offers a very optimistic view of what could be. Um, well, why haven't we changed things? And here's the thesis of the report. Because we haven't understood it. We've understood addiction in the wrong way. And we've institutionalized a kind of prevention and a kind of care that never has fit what we now understand about this illness. Just stop there. If I had 30-day treatment programs for diabetes, because really those damn diabetics brought it on themselves, they should learn, they should know better, and they should learn their lesson in 30 days. Do you think we'd have made any progress in the treatment of diabetes? Okay, that was the correct answer. Now, um, but now we do. We don't know enough, but we know enough to do way better than we've ever done. And we've done it before. We've had a major success in this country. You know what it is? Some of you kids probably don't know. Smoking. Think about the most addictive substance this country has ever known. It is nicotine. It's not, it's, this is not my opinion, this is a fact. It's the most politically protected, culturally ingrained, available, aggressively marketed substance you'll ever hear about. 
So how did that, how's that look? Well, here's the data. Past month cigarette smoking, again, by all people. The, the blue is, is high school kids. And this is 1965 to 2015. That's pretty damn good. 44% of adults in 1965 smoked. About 40% of doctors smoked. You could smoke in hospitals. Cigarettes were 25 cents a pack. Uh, they were subsidized by most state uh, government. Now, 16% of adults, 13% of youth. More people are quitting than are starting. The most addictive substance we've ever had? With all the power of the billions of dollars of the tobacco industry pushing it, and we made that kind of 64% reduction? Why? Because we didn't do with cigarettes what we've done with all other substances. We took a public health approach. Educate the public. Understand that it is not an entitlement and a lifestyle. Indeed, it is an illness. And it's an illness that is possible to prevent with policies and practices. It's a disease that you can intervene on early. Uh, if you equip properly doctors and nurses and, and they know how to do something, they can reduce it. Um, and, and that's the kind of um, keys to the success. So what you're going to hear for the rest of this talk is prevention policies uh, uh, to be delivered by families and communities, now finally engaging mainstream healthcare in, in uh, intervening early, recognizing and intervening early on misuse. Because if you want to find misuse, there are two good places to do it. One, colleges. Two, doctor's offices. It don't make no difference whether it's primary care, hospital-based, or ER. It's, it's very prevalent. And finally, a different model for how to treat seriously addicted. Okay, here we go. Prevention. Um, I was not the author of that chapter. Rico Catalano and, and a bunch of scientists uh, did. Um, and that's the target population for prevention. So, how do you prevent? It boils down to two things. The science of prevention is the science of preventing, reducing risk factors, and enhancing protective factors. Huh. Like, what's a risk factor? Well, risk factor can be um, your personal behavior. It can be the environment in which um, you live. Uh, these are, are the most common uh, risk factors, and protective also do the, uh, just do the opposite. Now, one of the things, uh, you're going to be surprised what gets flashed up here next. But, and I'm, I'm, I will always tell you if what I'm saying is a fact or whether it's my opinion. This ain't my opinion. This comes not just from this country, but from uh, most of Europe. If addiction is a chronic illness, virtually all chronic illnesses have an at-risk period. That, that window of time or vulnerability where if you get through it, you are not near as susceptible to that illness as you were, okay? And like all other uh, chronic illnesses, there is a critical at-risk period for addiction. Adolescence. And adolescence here is defined in terms of brain maturation as 12 to 25. Your brain does, it may not uh, seem like it, but your brain's uh, still developing, uh, particularly for males, up till around age 25. And what they find, and when we found epidemiology studies, 94% of all addictions occur. They, that is to say, they meet diagnostic criteria during adolescence. And now the clinicians among you are going, Come on. I got a whole uh, you know, program full of addicted people. They, they're 40 years old. They're 45 years old. Yep, that's right. They got it when they were in adolescence. And we're going to talk about why that's such an important and vulnerable period. 
Yes, it is because of who they hang around with, just like your mother told you, but there are you know, other factors, okay? And some of these um, factors are very important. The first point is, if you have a risk factor, for example, for addiction, if you're male um, and you have a first degree relative who has, a, uh, has met <coughs> diagnostic criteria for alcohol or any other addictive substance, you are at twice the risk of every other male. If you're, um, you've got a family history of any mental illness, you're about a, a third more likely to develop any addiction than anybody who, who doesn't. So those are some environmental risks, but, or some personal risks, but they are not by themselves dispositive. That is, it doesn't mean that because your father had addiction that you will definitely uh, develop it. Um, now, this is very important, and this is pretty new stuff. Um, and I'll just say that uh, what we've done in this country is develop lots of substance use uh, prevention programs. In the United States, uh, as recently as two years ago, there were 244 federally sponsored, federally supported drug abuse prevention programs. You probably didn't know that. Um, 244 different ones, and they were for s cocaine, and they were for methamphetamine, and opioid, and all that, and, that, and they're rushing like crazy to develop more, okay? Guess which federal agency has the largest, and by the way, the best, prevention program, drug abuse prevention program? Probably gonna say HHS. My friends, the police over here might say, no, it's justice, no? Agriculture. I say that just to tell you, it's all over the map. We've got them everywhere. Congressmen standing up saying, I know why these kids are getting addicted, because they don't have anything to do at night. Let's unchain the uh, basketball courts. That'll stop. And so it comes to pass. Somebody gives out money for a drug abuse prevention program to unlock basketball gates. I think it's a damn good idea, but it isn't a prevention. Okay? And point about, the second point about this is when you look at the science about it, it turns out that the same factors that predict susceptibility to drug abuse or alcohol abuse also predict lots of the things that harm our young. Early pregnancy, school dropout, delinquency, bullying, depression, suicidality. All of those are predicted by the same set of factors. So think about it. Would you, if it were your money, and by the way it is, would you have a whole, would you have a suicide prevention and a drug abuse and a methamphetamine and an alcohol and a dropout? Nope. You'd have a single, large, well-functioning, <coughs> continuously available prevention program that put, was in operation throughout the at-risk period, 12 to 25. Don't that make sense? Well, that's not what we've done. Um, risk factors, that's very important. Prevention's worth it. Risk factors can be modified. They can be uh, reduced and even eliminated. Uh, and there are two ways to do it. You can create policies, and that's a dirty word in, a, in the current administration, but it's true. Some of the most effective prevention forces are solid science-based policies. And the second way to do it is with programs, and I'll talk about programs in a minute. But policies at the community level, at the state level, or the federal level, just reducing the availability, making it a little bit more difficult to get alcohol, like Pennsylvania. You can only get liquor at a state store, and it's a pain in the neck. So it doesn't have the same hours as a, a bar, you know, and it's a little bit more money. It cut by 50% the number of alcohol-related driving and, and, and other incidents, okay? And, and again, the clinical people among you are now going, baloney, I know my guys. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the cost is, or they're gonna get it, and you're right. Again, it's the difference between when you are a user or a misuser and when you're addicted. When you're addicted, you've lost control. You will get it, you'll find a way. Ask our friends, the police here. They're all too familiar with people doing anything they can to get. Okay, 
So I don't really believe you, Tom. This, this, I never heard of a, any kind of government program that made any difference whatsoever. I, it seems to me I heard somebody recently say that, as a matter of fact. Anyway, um, here is data that come directly from the uh, uh, Surgeon General's report, which is a review of the last 30 years of research. And anything you do by raising prices or raising taxes on alcohol reduces drinking rates and drinking-related problems. I'll show you a good example in a minute. By 30 percent, that's big. And there's been 112 separate studies of this, thousands of case studies. Wow, I guess states are rushing to increase the price or the taxes for alcohol. Not since 1968 has there been. So in a very real sense, every state is subsidizing the price of alcohol. Okay. Uh, another thing, if you reduce the number of outlets in an environment, in a neighborhood, number of bars, the number of package stores, it reduces drinking and drinking-related problems. Doesn't reduce addiction. It reduces drinking and drinking-related problems. And if you privatize, as so many states are, are, are rushing to do, it actually increases sales. And again, lots of studies that show that. Here's a good example of the results of one federal policy. Here is uh, displayed our U.S. traffic fatalities uh, among underage kids from 1982 right to 2010. So there's the number of fatal non-alcohol related traffic accidents over that period. It's, um, you might say it's level, it's actually gone up a little bit. Uh-huh, so what? Well, what about alcohol-related? Well, my God, they've really gone down. They've gone down 64%. Whoa, look, and look at this. I wonder what happened there. Because that's when things really started to change. Well, you can thank Ronald Reagan for that. Ronald Reagan said, we're not going to, you, states, you don't have to raise the drinking age to 21. It's a state's rights issue. I certainly am not going to get in the way of states doing what they want. However, I'm not going to give you highway money unless your state uh, raises the drinking age to 21. And it has been one of the most effective policies, saved countless lives, just that point. Okay? And to, to continue, this is possible at the county level, it's possible at the community level, it's possible at state and, of course, federal level. Um, I'm not going to go into addiction, uh, uh, into uh, prevention pr programs for just for lack of time, but they too are quite effective. And the key to them that we now understand is because we now understand the at risk period is the kind of prevention you have in your school, or certainly I had in mine, where you get the drugs are bad lecture uh, during some part of eighth grade health. Here's a clue, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because it doesn't cover the at-risk period. It's like a mother saying to her young Irish kid, you know, you've got light skin, stay out of the sun. Are, are we clear? Stay out of the sun. That ain't no prevention program. Here's what it is. Uh, sunblock every time you go out in the sun, because you're at risk every time. And what they found is that if you tell parents how to do parent-appropriate things, churches how to give uh, uh, clergy how to do uh, appropriate to support that at the community level, um, police, education, and primary care, if they all learn about it and they coordinate, it costs about $100,000 per year per community, and it reduces, and this has been done with randomized controlled trials, it reduces all the drug and alcohol related problems that we just listed by 30 to 40%. So it is, it pays for itself the first six months it's in operation. So, moving along. 
Now we're, we're moving up this uh, pyramid, right? So we're not down at the, at the bottom. We're now up in the place where there's been a loss of control. And let's talk about that. Because this is new stuff. It's certainly not the way we have come to think about addiction. The, in, historically, addiction has been a personality disorder. It's a character disorder. It used to be grouped when, when they started the, the Diagnostic and Statistical uh, Manual. It was grouped in there with personality disorders. And um, the, what follows would be, um, to, to, to counteract it, tough love, follow rules, get with the program. First of all, you get a program and you break that character down to build it back up. That's the way lots of addiction treatment has been delivered in this country with that premise. By the way, I don't say that's crazy. And I'm, I'm not here to tell you that alcohol and drug dependent patients, individuals, don't have character problems. Many of them do. But I am telling you, that ain't the reason for addiction. Okay. Um, next way we thought about it, and this was now we're up into the 70s, 80s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, addiction was physical dependence. And you got withdrawal, tolerance and withdrawal. They were the hallmarks, the cardinal symptoms of addiction. There were hard drugs that you could get addicted to, like barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and of course opioids because you could see these dramatic uh, flu-like symptoms of withdrawal and all that. That's what addiction was, and therefore, what do you need? You need to detoxify from addiction. You need to get those toxins out. Now, the withdrawal and, and tolerance have been dissipated. You leave the program a little sadder but wiser, and, and that ought to work. Didn't work. Okay. Now <clears throat> we hear addiction is a series of bad choices, um, deviant lifestyle. And again, I'm not telling you addiction is a good choice. I'm not telling you, no, no, these are terrific citizens. I'm not saying that. I am saying that the science does not bear out that that's the cause of the addiction. It's one of the results of addiction. One of the things that is said and correctly said is that addicts bring it on themselves. They definitely do. That is, all you liberals in the audience, sorry, they do. They bring it on themselves. But think about it. Is that the criterion we use to provide care? If you brought this illness, uh, infection, uh, disability on yourself, we withhold treatment from people? Guy breaks his leg while he's uh, robbing a bank. Where do they take him first? To jail? No, they take him to the hospital to fix his leg. But he, but he brought it on himself. So, so, so that's point one. Here's point two. Does anybody remember when addictions start? Nobody. Okay, 94% during adolescence. Well, as one who has never made a bad choice during my adolescence, I can, I can say it's about time we crack down on those lawless adolescents and punish them for the rest of their lives because they brought it on themselves, okay? Um, what follows from that kind of thinking is the kind of treatment structure and insurance benefit and evaluation uh, expectations that uh, suggest that if that's the way it is, the only people that really understand addiction are people who have themselves been addicted. And uh, they'll, they'll break through that lifestyle. And, and why I'm going through all this is because these are the concepts. These are not mine. These are the concepts that have developed the segregated, separately financed, specialty care addiction treatment system that we have in this country now. We have about 13,000 specialty addiction treatment programs in the United States. Um, if you say, I'm going to rehab, I know what comes to your mind. It's this plush place with a great view of uh, uh, the ocean out your bedroom window, which has 400 thread count sheets. Uh-uh. 
That's less than 1% of all. The great majority of these programs are outpatient programs. Most are nonprofit. Most treat very few people. And most treat them with separate government funding, not health care dollars. And that's why. Because we never thought about addiction as part of health care. It was a lifestyle. It was a bad character, uh, bad choices. Hmm. So addiction hasn't been part of health care. Um, you, you don't find a lot of medical schools. I hope this one's different. But less than 10% of American medical schools, nursing schools, pharmacy schools have a course in addiction. Why would you? It's not health care. You can't get reimbursed for it. You, uh, it's not on the board exams, all that stuff, OK? Uh, addiction care has not been reimbursed through health care. It's been carved out, if it's been carved at all. But up until 2008, only 12% of all the addiction treatment episodes in this country were covered by any insurance. The much dreaded Obamacare changed that policy so that now it's called parity, so that uh, you, you have to provide equal kind of care. And surprise, surprise, for these reasons, people don't go around going, wow, Johnny just graduated from rehab. Yes, sir. I went, oh, well, my, took the wife. We all went up there, took pictures. Oh, boy, proudest day of my life. Uh, you know, you hide it. I know parents who, like me, have lost children. They don't even put it on the death certificate. They're that ashamed. So let's take this apart. Let's think about this again, because we're in a medical institution. It's terrific science, thanks to Catherine and her group and, and many others. It's terrific science going on. We know more. Here's what we know. These are the criteria now that have been used to diagnose an addictive disorder. Yes, addiction to marijuana or cocaine or what, all of those. And I'm, no, I'm not going to go through all of them. <coughs> But if you boil them all down, they relate to one factor, diminished control over use. Person says he wants to, to stop, but he doesn't. Says he's only going to use a little bit, uses a lot. Says he never will use again, he does use. So you, you can see why somebody, if, especially if you're a family member, you, you, you can see why people say it's a character disorder. He's a liar. He wasn't raised right. He's stupid. OK. But there might be something else that could cause diminished control. Now, um, this is what we found. That number one, like all other chronic illnesses, it involves gene expression. At, not a single gene, multiple genes. Um, it involves uh, incremental substance-induced. So I'm not kidding when I say people bring it on themselves. They do. The more they use, the more these changes occur. Uh, so incremental changes in the stress response system and brain circuits controlling motivation, inhibition, reward sensitivity. Boy, it would be nice if we could see that. That would, that would uh, uh, yes, and that's an important point. These changes go on. They don't stop the day after you stop your drug use. So detox by itself is truly a waste of money. It is relapse in the making, OK? So it's nice if you could see it. Here's, here, for example, is what technology has done in uh, diagnosing heart disease. Here, for example, right there, is uh, the, uh, a picture of a heart uh, pumping, functioning beautifully. How do you know that? Are you a cardiologist, Tom? Nope. But this is red and yellow, OK? This is an unhealthy heart, and it ain't red and yellow. It is um, du dull, OK? I don't know what color it is. OK. Boy, it would be nice if, if we could actually see that in the affected organ of an addicted person. Well, you can. And some of this work is done here. Here is the organ that is affected in all addictions. It is called the brain. But not just the whole brain, the circuits within it. Here, um, here is the normal, the, these are uh, sections of the brain. If you just 
if I, my uh, head were cut off and looked in and you saw red and yellow when my uh, uh, brain was functioning and all those, that is a normal brain. I am not a brain uh, expert, but I can tell you that it's yellow, okay? Now, the next is, this is cocaine use, okay? Done by Nora Volkoff at NIDA. This is 10 days after a person stops their cocaine use. And once again, I can say with scientific certainty, there's not a lot of yellow going on right there, okay? <laughs> Think about it, this, when do you get out of detox? Three to five days. So you say in Philadelphia, yo. It's, it's not, you know, not, not normal. Well, how about this set? That's 100 days after cessation. And the truth is we don't know if the brain ever returns to, quote, normal. We don't know if it started in an abnormal way and can't get to normal. We don't know that. But again, without trivializing this, the affected organ in this chronic illness is the brain. And we know that it is affected for a very long period of time. It's simple, simply stopping is not going to take the disease away. Um, like uh, other illnesses, there's a genetic f factor. Um, if I drink the same amount as my buddy, but my father's an alcoholic, I am more likely to get the disease. To illustrate, here's eye color. Suppose I say twin A is going to walk through the door here. He's got blue eyes. I'll give you a dollar if you can guess what color the eyes are of twin B, who will be walking through this door. Everybody gets a dollar. His eyes are going to be blue. And the reason is eye color is 100% genetically determined. Well, Illness, chronic illnesses are not 100% genetically determined. Many other factors contribute. Your personal choice, your culture, uh, lots of things, okay? So there's real illnesses, asthma, diabetes, hypertension, and you can see that in twin studies involving males, you know, if twin A has uh, asthma, the chances are 35 to 70%. Not 100, 35 to 70 percent, the twin B is going to get asthma. Okay? It's not 100 percent because twin B may do lots of different things than twin A. Okay? Um, yeah, that's great, Tom. I'm really interested. But I thought you were talking about addiction. Yeah, I am. Here's twin studies with alcohol, opioid, cocaine. And they're right in the same range. So, very important point. Does it mean that if you have a first degree relative or a twin who's addicted, you definitely are going to be addicted? It does not mean that. It does mean you're more vulnerable. And if you are an adolescent, and if your environment is loaded with drugs, and if nobody, there are no consequences for your use of drugs, you're very vulnerable. Okay? So, uh, you, many of you can read. I'm sure you can. Uh, you don't need me to repeat this. Uh, it's easy. Anybody can become addicted, but it's a lot easier if you've got these vulnerability factors: genetic, environmental, personal. Okay. And it's not just that your brain suddenly gets blue when you're addicted. No, that isn't the the reason. Um, it's there are specific circuits and regions. Reward, stress, executive function. And there are people in this audience who know much more about this than me. Okay? Uh huh. So, um, so, addiction number one is not just a lot of partying. It's not because partying, you still have pretty damn good, not while you're drunk, but you have pretty damn good control over your decision making about to use, not to use, stopping, start, all that stuff. And you can be influenced by your peers, you can learn about it, you can do, there are lots of things you can do. So early interventions are really quite good, uh, but not when you're addicted. When you're addicted, you've got brain changes that we do not know are ever gonna go back, and we do know for sure that you're gonna remain vulnerable uh, for a long period of time. 
Uh, so best to think of it as a chronic illness. And you might say, are these your opinions, Tom? Uh, yes, they are my opinions, but these are also the conclusions of the Surgeon General's report, uh, which was reviewed by a thousand experts at five federal agencies. And yesterday, uh, Academy of uh, Clinical Practice, 150,000 physicians, did an independent review of this, came to exactly the same conclusion. We've been thinking about this wrong. We've got to stop thinking about it as a personality disorder, start thinking about it as a chronic illness, and we should tailor our insurance, our coverage, our, our programs to properly treat that. Um, so is this a brand new kind of thing that doctors are going to have to learn about? Oh, all that different language and funny terms? No, it isn't. The goals of addiction treatment are the same as they are for any other chronic illness. Reduce the cardinal symptoms to non-problem levels. If it's diabetes, get that hemoglobin A1C down, okay? Improve health and function. Relieving symptoms by themselves rarely satisfying to any patient. They want to improve their function. Finally, because it's a chronic illness, you got to teach the patient and their families how to manage recurrence. They will, you can't cure it. You can manage it, but you can't cure it. Also, the treatment methods should be the same. Um, personalized care. They don't have diabetes programs. They don't send somebody in to a place where uh, everybody gets exactly the same thing if, if it's Tuesday, regardless of the nature of your illness, the severity of it. That would be malpractice. That's the way we've always treated addiction. I'm not making fun of it. It's nobody, nobody purposely did it. It's because of how we understood it. Well, we've been wrong. Um, Evidence-based medications, behavioral therapies, and social supports are the active ingredients of treatment, regardless of where it is. Most insurance programs haven't fully reimbursed for them, and so they're not available. Clinical monitoring has been something addicted, uh, addiction programs have not wanted to do because if they found drug use on a patient, they would say, ooh, he's bad, we're gonna throw him out of care. And they didn't want to do that. Well, you know, you monitor blood pressure every time you go into a, a doctor's office. And when the blood pressure is high, what do you do? You adjust the care, you intensify it, you change it, okay? I think I'm going behind. All right. So that's really great, Tom. You told us uh, what we're doing wrong. Is, is anybody doing it right? And the answer is yes. Physicians are doing it right. And before I go on, and I, I'm going to show you some really very helpful, very good data for physicians and airline pilots. But again, suppose I said, you know, we got really good treatment for diabetes. You can really do well in diabetes treatment, but sorry, you can only get it if you're a doctor or an airline pilot. Think the United States government would put up with that? I, I hope to God no, okay? I know the public wouldn't put up with All right. The reason I'm putting this up is because this is fundamentally different than the way anybody else gets treated. Um, it, it's done when there's a suspicion that your colleague, um, a physician colleague or an airline uh, pilot colleague, is under the influence or suffering from uh, excessive use of any substance, it is your ethical duty to report them. And you report them to the licensing board. Now, you got to be a miserable SOB rat to ruin your colleague's career for that, over that suspicion. So they created physician health plans so that you could carry out your ethical responsibility but not ruin their career. Here's what they do. They first of all say, I, you know, Billy said you have an alcohol problem, let's see. So they do a very comprehensive evaluation, they bring the family in, colleagues, uh, et cetera, a diagnostic interview. If it's clear that, that uh, you know, you do have a substance use problem, they offer you a deal, sort of like drug courts. We won't go further in prosecuting you. We will, you can retain your license, but you gotta 
go into and st actively participate and stay in the program, which is basically five years. But you don't have to. You want to go to court? We're going we're to go after you. Most physicians say, all right, I'll do it. None of them like it. None of them say, wow, I'm so glad somebody gave me this opportunity. No, they don't like it, okay? Um, and uh, the results are all monitored by the, by the uh, state licensing board. Okay, now treatment starts. And the first part of treatment is pretty much like what your kid will get or you would get if you decide you want to pick up a cocaine problem, okay? You'll get residential care. You aren't going to get no 90 days, but you'll get maybe 21 days of residential, and then you'll be referred maybe to outpatient, assuming your insurer covers it. You'll be referred to outpatient, and when they, once that happens and they do it, they can return to practice on or about month three, these physicians. By the way, my physician is an addicted physician, and I'll, I'll show you why. And it's the same physician that treats my grandkids, okay? But after that, you're in, you're in aftercare. But, but wait, there's more. The last phase of this is when you've gone through all the primary treatment, you don't just get um, Refer you don't just get a referral to a church basement. No, you get, you're asked to go to AA and Caduceus Society meetings, you're asked to do family therapy, you're suggested, not required, family therapy. Uh, worksite visits come along, you know, somebody shows up, says, hey Billy, let's, uh, let's go have a cup of coffee and uh, fill this cup, okay? <laughs> and any time for the next four years, you're under the gun. The phone every day. If your number comes up, you have to drop a urine. If that urine is positive, you could lose your license. In practice, that rarely happens. Instead, they do something extraordinary. They intensify treatment if you're not responding to that level of care. All right, all right, those are doctors, for God's sake. How's it go? Wow, 78% at five years. I want to be, I want to emphasize that. This doesn't mean at five years somebody took a urine test and 78% were positive, or 78% were clean, no. It means that throughout the entire five year period, this, this is published in the British Medical Journal, prospective study of 1,000 doctors, okay? 78% never gave a positive urine throughout the entire five year period. How about the guys that did? Only 26% ever gave a second. And now, because I'm a psychologist and a keen student of human behavior, I know what you're thinking. Of course these doctors, these airline pilots, they, they did well, of course they did. They had everything to lose, and let's agree, they're basically gods to start with, right? <laughs> so then you might be surprised to learn that when you, when you evaluate physicians and airline pilots going to exactly the same programs for the first 30 days. You know, the same stuff you and your kids get. They too are under the gun. They too have a lot to learn. What's their relapse rate? Did somebody say 60% at three months? Yes, that's their relapse rate. No, they put their pants on the same way we do. They are affected by a chronic illness in the same way. They get the kind of care and monitoring that is appropriate for the illness. And that's why on holidays or July 4th or something, I'm, I gotta go to the doctor, my guy is in this program because I know he is not under the effects of alcohol or other drugs. I hope yours isn't either, okay. so. These are serious health problems. They affect a tremendous swath of the public. Uh, they're killing our young. That's not an exaggeration. We definitely need more research. We need the kind of stuff that Catherine and her group are, are doing. I'm sure many of you are doing other kinds of clinical work. But we already know a great deal, and we're not putting it into effect. We could. Um, especially in medical settings. 
it has been a willful decision to ignore substance misuse and addiction. Not just in uh, Galveston and Houston, University of Pennsylvania, everywhere. U University of Pennsylvania, where I spent most of my life. There was a point at which we, one year, we had $70 million that year coming in from NIDA and NIAAA research. That's a lot of money. So when we did, when we would find somebody with an addiction problem, where did we treat them? Oh, we didn't have a treatment program. It's okay to research it, but we don't want those people in our midst. Well, they're in your midst, ladies and gentlemen. They are there. All right, enough of my preaching here. Um, it, and it's been very expensive on, for, for healthcare generally to ignore this because it affects all areas of medicine. All right. Um, it can be treated. Even very serious cases can be treated. It's not enough to have terrific treatment. It's much, it's as important to have effective prevention and early intervention. But even serious cases can be treated effectively with recovery. Now, expectable, okay? So, once again, prevention, this is what the Surgeon General's report is arguing for. Community-based uh, prevention, policies and programs, Early intervention in schools, especially school clinics, especially colleges, especially primary care, but every place. And a much different model for specialty care treatment than the acute care, 30-day um, shame them and blame them treatments that we've been. And with that, I'm open to questions if we still have time. And, and again, these slides are available. I'm sure Catherine can uh, help you get them. We'll be happy to share them. Anybody that would like to can ask me. We have questions for Dr. McClellan. Yep. Nice and loud. Bad ears. So, uh, so when we think about substance use disorders, uh, specifically alcohol use disorder, one treatment modality that comes to mind are folks that programs, alcohol, et cetera. Yeah. Um, even we know that some outpatient programs even uh, promote uh, inclusion or participation in folks that programs. But we also know that for uh, uh, a large number of individuals, the, that program is, is ineffective. However, there's still a continued culture that kind of promotes participation in folks that programs. So I'm just hoping that you could comment on uh, how folks that programs fit into future you know, yeah. you're, you're not going to hear me complain about 12-step and AA programs. First of all, the research in the Surgeon General's report supports the effectiveness. If AA were a pharmaceutical intervention and went through FDA trials, it would be approved with the same level. It works. Wait a minute, Tom, I know somebody who went to AA and didn't like it and it didn't work. That's right. It turns out AA is sort of like going to a gym. Going in the gym, but not making any of that metal go up and down, and then, then it's going to do it. <laughs> Having an AA membership card isn't going to do it. You've got to go and you've got to practice. Factually, about 10% of the factually, most of the people who are in recovery got there through some version of self-help. Um, but it's nothing close to enough because lots of people don't like it for 10,000 reasons. Um, so we don't want to expunge it. We just want to add to it, okay? Uh, the reason AA works is the reason that primary, uh, the uh, physician health plans work. Any day, any time, every, all night and for free, you can go to an AA meeting, and you'll get an AA sponsor who'll come to your house and talk you through something, buy you a cup of coffee, and keep you from making that relapse decision. That ain't a bad thing. We need more, but there you go. Yes, ma'am. Um, perhaps you can comment on the term that's being used a lot in the literature and, and in newspapers by media, and I hope that I'm fair to escape by drugs. Yeah, I will comment on that. For most of my life and most of the research, 
Oh, sorry. A uh, uh, young lady was asking about the concept of gateway drugs. Um, is it still relevant, and, and, and what do I think about it? These are my – first, I'll tell you the research. Research shows that it's hard to say that any particular drug opens the way for um, successive use for others. This is especially true now when in many places opioids are more available than marijuana, which used to be the gateway drug. So if there's a thing called a gateway drug, it's the most available drug to start you off. This is why, before somebody else asks this question, I don't like the idea of legalizing marijuana. And it's because if what I said from the start, if you make any substance, I, I know very well that not everybody's going to get addicted to marijuana. I know that. I, I, and if you tell me it's no worse than alcohol, you're not going to get an argument from me. Okay. But I know this, that if you make any potentially addictive substance easier to get, cheaper, more available, more people will use. That, ask anybody that sells anything, and that will, they'll tell you the same thing. Once that happens, now math takes over. 30% of the users are going to have some kind of marijuana-related problem uh, something. And about 10, 8 to 10 percent are going to become addicted. Yes, ma'am? Uh, the issue of poly substance abuse is, you know, pretty much everyone uses more than one substance. Right. Um, and it's not, it's very poorly addressed in most literature. So maybe, sorry, it's what? It's poorly addressed in most literature. So moving forward with um, how we can start focusing on treating addictive disorders and misuse. Can you comment on how poly substance abuse could be incorporated? Right. Well, I think some of the research done here is, is some of the best um, uh, way to answer that question. Um, poly substance use is the mode, not the exception. Alcohol, cocaine, and marijuana is the combination that most, that at least until very, very recently, was the combination that most people came into treatment. Um, your research shows it, uh, all of them can uh, interact with innate levels of uh, impulsivity. Um, and together, especially in a developing brain like an adolescent's brain, it will, um, it, it just augments the effect of any one of those drugs by itself. After that, I don't really have much to say. If you say, should we have, well, I will say this. I think with that, because that's the model, because any of the drugs does a lot of what all the other drugs do, they don't, they don't by any means have exactly the same characteristics, but many of them, reward properties, uh, inhibitory reduction problems, things like that. I think the proper goal of treatment for an addicted person no, not a college kid that's drinking too often, but an addicted person. I think the proper goal is abstinence, total abstinence. I think it's the best way to bet. That seems to be the high value outcome. Thank you, though, for the lecture. It should be required to give for all of our legislators. Uh, I'm a prevention researcher, and I actually school based as well, and do studies looking at implementing and evaluating a program to. Uh, prevent substance use and violence in middle and high schools. And so when you said that schools should not adopt a one-off workshop, that's why you might have seen my team get really excited. And uh, so my question is, how do we get policymakers to realize this? And then a second question that's a little bit less related is, you mentioned that, uh, that and, and this might reveal my political leanings, that, if, that addicted folks don't bring it on themselves. But I'm wondering how you reconcile that with middle school, high school being the, the, the critical period where they're most at risk, and then also some of the risk factors like poverty, exposure to violence, yes. and, and parental determinants. Um, okay. Um, I'm no prevention expert. The real prevention, well, I guess you are, but also uh, Rico Catalano and, and, and He's people. He's part of that grant. Okay. So um, school-based prevention is a damn good start, but it's not enough. Um, 
parents doing the right thing, parenting the right way, quote, the right way, damn good thing, not enough. Uh, the, what seems to be the critical ingredient is when all sectors of the community that have access to these kids during their vulnerable period work together so that, like Sunblock, the kid gets the same message, gets it a little differently from his church, a little differently from his parents, but fundamentally core the same. Okay? That's the high value prevention. And the good news is you don't have to have a prevention program for every damn thing that could be uh, a problem. It's, they have many, very, very significant overlap. Now, how do you get policymakers to understand? Well, that's why I put the example of smoking up there. And it's useful to return to that. There was a time not that long ago when uh, cigarettes weren't addictive. Don't be ridiculous. Smoking is part of adult transition. It's a lifestyle. You have your right to smoke. You, you know, and uh, you know, tobacco manufacturers are not scum. No siree. They are creating jobs for Ameri American workers. Okay? That changed with the Surgeon General's report and the unassailable scientific finding. It didn't happen like that. But that started the ball rolling. It started the ball rolling for legal action against secondary smoke. And ultimately, as people change their attitudes, politicians, always the last ones to follow, truly, said, yeah, I guess we better stop those uh, tobacco subsidies. Yeah, that's a little bit awkward. What with our kids dying from uh, smoking? You know, and, and that's how it works. That is the earnest hope of this Surgeon General's report. Thank you. Okay, quickly, thank you very much. I do believe that uh, your record should be a part of you, and I think everyone should be the report. Well, well, good question. I'm going to focus on the, <laughs> your last slide. Will you illustrate three um, avenues to improve right. the situation? The question I have is for your personal opinion. Uh, if you're starting from scratch, um, yep. do you do all three at the same time, or do you start at the bottom and work to the top, or how, how do you? Yes, you do all three at the same time because you can, and because like any other public health issue, that's what you really want to do. If you've got Zika virus, you want to treat people the right way with the right medications so that they um, can recover. Uh, you want to look for it early, and you want to empower and enable your, your healthcare workers, but also your community to recognize early stage. And meanwhile, you want to get out there and you want to spray all those swamps. Okay. So it's the same model. And very, very, very important, you can. You can. The data from the Surgeon General's report, the data from the last 30 years of work, suggest this is not, uh, you know, someday we're going to be able to go to Mars. No. We've got lots of the tools we need right now. We simply have to get some of the antiquated thinking and some of the, the legislative uh, uh, ideology out of the way so that we can institute a problem. Philosophically, it's totally personally, I agree. Uh, putting my operator's hat on, yes. I'm saying, you know, certainly, and I agree, you want all three, but I would argue that each of those probably has a cost associated with it. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and therefore, if resources are limited, um, and, and you have to lean more to one than the other while you're working all three together, I would mean, say two things. First, they definitely do have a cost. But you know what? We have a budget. Even in healthcare, we've got a budget. It's called $120 billion that's being wasted right now. If I could say 10% of that, $12 billion, it would fund the whole package, okay? But if I had to choose, I'm a treatment guy. I've done this my whole life. Prevention. You affect more people earlier, cheaper, with less um, problems. Thank you all very much. UTMB Health, working together to work wonders.